let's take some of the laws that we've identified kind of at the intersection of our empirical investigations, identifying that these laws capture observations and patterns that occur generally across different sectors, but also that can be explained by our more fundamental theories and theorems, our formal scientific basis. And two of those laws that we can talk about are the law of fluency and the law of stretch systems. Now, what's important about these is they are not simply processes or patterns of adaptation, general patterns, lawful patterns of adaptation, but they are also about co-adapting so that resilience engineering is about the RE, or vision, reframing, right? all the different variations, the replanning, et cetera, in that future-oriented time frame for extensibility, but it's also about co-adapting not how just one unit adapts in our network, uh, our layered network, but rather how adaptation and co-adaptation, whether that is synchronizing and building capabilities over a wider neighborhood of the network, or whether that is uh, breaking apart, fragmenting, siloing the different adaptive responses, undermining the performance of larger swaths of the network. So let's take each of those for a moment and think about the dynamic pattern of co-adaptation that each captures, even though it's simply named the law of fluency. Fluency, what does that mean? Right? It means well-adapted activity hides right, the difficulties handled and the dilemmas resolved. Now parse all those words. Hides from whom? Hides from another perspective well-adapted activity. Oh, there's some agent, some unit is carrying out that activity. That activity is fluent because it is, becomes a skilled, smooth way to handle what? Gaps, right? Surprises, snafus, because they occur smaller, larger, one way or another at some regular pace in the world. So we've got a perspective of Adapt of activity adapting to fill the gaps. Okay. Now, we also have that activity confronting dilemmas. Where do dilemmas come from? They come from conflict. Right? Different goals right, conflict given the pressures, information, options, uncertainty ahead. So based on trade-offs and goal conflicts, dilemmas arise. Those dilemmas have no absolute answer. That's what the word dilemma means. The people on the scene, right, in face of uncertainty, the novelty and equality, what's the potential novelty they're facing and how do they need to adapt and adjust what is normally done or how they normally handle abnormalities and anomalies in order to cope with this one. So confronting the dilemma comes from what? These goal conflicts and trade-offs. Well, the goal conflicts come from different roles at different layers, right? Uh, and how they value or prioritize some goals over others, how they are positioned in the multidimensional trade space to emphasize a certain uh, gain versus another potential loss. Moving on one trade-off dimension right, influences the expected gains and losses, the prior prioritization over other dimensions of, in the trade space. So prioritization, reprioritization inevitably influences and interacts uh, across the interdependencies in the tangled layer network, affecting different units, adaptive units at different layers in the system. So the law of fluency is a window into a co-adaptive process that goes on over time. Now notice the breakdowns that the law of fluency implies. It, a breakdown between a close-up perspective adapting in order to fill gaps, handle small snafus, right? uh, that fluency law says it hides from another perspective so that there is a gap. 
So this means the fluency law highlights work as imagined from a distance versus work as done, right, at, a, um, at the face where adaptive agents touch a world cha that changes, brings advantage and brings risk and negative consequences as well at that sort of rock face and touching real systems with real consequences. So we see a gap. So notice how the law of fluency connects to work as imagined, work as done, how that connects to the fundamentals about trade-offs, how that connects to the need to synchronize across the different roles and layers in the network. So we can start to see how those three forms of adaptive system breakdown and the three opposites to the breakdown risk, the three skills that we need, anticipation, synchronization, and revision versus being too slow to adapt and keep pace with change, and especially when challenge arises and things deteriorate, right? We work at cross purposes, so we're locally adaptive, but don't take into account a broader part of the factors governing a neighborhood, a region of the network. And so we work at cross purposes, we fragment, we silo, and therefore have less effective response from a broader perspective, right? And we get stuck in stale models of how the world works, right? Versus being able to revise and reframe in, in pace with the changes that say the world is different than it used to be. The incidents we're seeing, the challenges we're facing are different than what we used to see on some dimension that says we need to rethink our balances, right, and the different ideas and processes that we've laid out. So that's the law of fluency as a co-adaptive process. You can think about that diagrammatically in terms of perspectives, relationships, models, trade-offs. Well, let's take the other one. The law of stretch systems. Law of stretch systems arises focusing on that third fundamental that other agents are adapting. So when we make an improvement, so think about that in terms of the short term horizon, acute time horizon on seeking opportunity, we make an improvement in faster, better, cheaper. What does that do? That creates an opportunity for other agents to consume or exploit that advantage or uh, exploit that improvement for their advantage. The end result is those adaptations around the injection of new capability, a new improvement, leads to a new intensity and tempo of activity. It's not the old activity under less pressure. No, it moves that, it transforms that activity and it puts it under new levels of pressure, right, that transform and change the activity and push it back near the edge of the confidence envelope. In other words, the possibility for it to be in the borderlands around the confidence envelope remains. This uh, uh, observation has arisen multiple times. And the law of stretch systems was pulled out and identified in particular in 1998 that you can see in a monograph Richard Cook and I wrote. And it's uh, captured as one of our, our lawful patterns of adaptive, co-adaptive behavior. So again, let's think about the relationships here. What are the different perspectives? All right, we've got a perspective looking at a local activity, handling challenge and understanding, right, that there are difficulties and improvements of the local adaptations to handle challenges, challenges and fill gaps. Oh, wait a minute. I, that broader perspective can now say we can develop and insert capability into that operational context for that portion of the tangled layered network. Great. We have an improvement. Oh, wait, no, there is another right, regional or distant perspective relative to the area where we're trying to improve handling challenges. Right? And what do they do? The fact that we've reduced workload, for example, uh, we have uh, will we'll, uh, adapt in a different way. For example, they might reduce training. Or we've reduced workload. They might reduce the personnel available. They might re they might act in a variety of ways. And in fact, we observe that kind of consumption of new capabilities by others adapting 
all over the place. We've seen it in the introduction of cockpit automation and aviation and how that's influenced and modified the way that we prepare and build expertise and experience in pilot line pilots flying in commercial aircraft. Uh, we've seen it in many other places as well. So we're seeing multiple regional perspectives relative to a local perspective, right? We see how handling challenge is difficult, and so we move in and improve things. We inject new capabilities, deploy new capabilities. Measurement in advance that it say reduces workload, great. That's, but it stimulates a process of adaptation from these other perspectives, seeking their advantage, especially under faster, better, cheaper pressure. What will they do, right? They will consume that advantage, creating a new intensity and tempo of activity, new complexity. So the system changes. There's still a confidence envelope. We still operate, right, in part near that uh, borderlands area. We extensibility is still critical, right? Again, it's a hard constraint, right? How we achieve and support extensibility, right, may change because the resources available are different. Uh, and uh, so our emphasis on net adaptive value comes back into focus. So a fundamental like net adaptive value can be seen as explaining the law of stretch systems, the law of stretch systems point you to the net adaptive value concept, reinforcing its power and universality. So let's think about the law of stretch systems also relative to time. And another concept called saturation. So with respect to time, it's talking about that tempo of activity matters, where and how overload occurs matters, right? And so there was a tempo of activity and a tempo of how the experience of overload and the adaptation to the potential or actuality of experiencing periods of overload. So as people regularly experience overload and adapt to handle that local time perspective handling challenge, the pattern of workload over time relative to the world changes. But again, it doesn't simply become a easier job, right? It's a different pattern of intensity and tempo over time. That means the potential for approaching saturation remains. By lowering load, increasing capabilities, doesn't mean that we stay away from the borderlands. We stay away from the boundaries of the confidence envelope. No, we get pushed back at the edge of the confidence envelope into those borderlands through the new experiences of intensity, right? And overload, right? At different times, giving the varying tempo. The experience at the boundaries means we are still at risk of approaching saturation. We still regularly approach saturation, right? Saturation, running out of, of the ability to continue to respond, to be responsive to increasing challenge, right? Saturation turns out to be a universal concept that drives a lot of the ability, both, both deriving from the theoretical developments and driving the practical interventions that we can do. What happens as the system approaches saturation, right? What are the different ways we adapt when approaching saturation? How does our behavior approaching saturation for one unit influence neighboring units? How do neighboring units behavior when another interdependent unit is approaching saturation? Does it reinforce its adaptive capacity or does it constrict its adaptive capacity of the unit that's under risk of saturation? So the risk of saturation and its opposite, the capacity for maneuver ahead, right? And that we need to control this parameter of capacity for maneuver ahead. We don't want it to saturate. We don't want to run out of future adaptive capacity. So that turns out to be locally critical thing to do at certain scales for certain roles. And we can demonstrate that, for example, with automation and people, uh, pilots in the cockpit. 
but it also applies abstractly in general across this universe, as we've been explaining, all right, about the seeking opportunity, handling challenge, and how that works at, with two different temporal frames of reference, an acute backward looking one to build faster, better, cheaper performance, and a future oriented one, right, to better improve extensibility in the face of the potential for brittle collapse.